Welcome to Global Forum, a platform for discussion of global issues from global perspectives. Today's focus is going to be on the U.S. presidential and congressional elections and the extent to which human rights and civil liberties have been or have not been reflected in these elections. We have invited a number of distinguished guests to talk about these issues. That includes Professor Peter Lender, that includes Attorney Mahar, Sean Mahar, and also Ms. Karpova, who is a peace activist and also a civil rights activist. But before I bring them on, let's hear a statement by Senator Mike Graval, who is a U.S. presidential election at this, can candidate at this time, and he's one of the very few people who have taken such a clear and precise stand on civil liberties. Here is Senator Mike Graval. This is Senator Mike Graval. I want to weigh in on a subject uh, with respect to the Bush administration and uh, the horrible approach that they take uh, to justice, in fact, the injustice as they continue to perpetuate. Uh, we can deal objectively many times to these injustices in the abstract when we talk about the terrible things they do with respect to torture in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. But when you know the people personally, it takes a, a personal and a different dimension. I've met the daughter of Dr. Uh, Al Aryan, uh, and I want to tell you this is a personal injustice. Here is a man of peace who was brought to trial by the Justice Department of George Bush, and in a Tampa court by a jury, he was declared innocent. And that's after the government spent over $50 million on this court case. And that's after they had interviewed Mossad agents, they had thousands of people, thousands of hours and testimony, and they didn't have any substantial evidence to, to convict him. So he was declared innocent. Time magazine went so far as to say that this was a terrible setback to George Bush. And of course, it was a wonderful victory for the Constitution of the United States. And, and now they were, they were committed at the time to release him in 05. And that time has passed. He is still in prison to this day. And there's no reason for that. And you get all the machinations within these uh, prosecutorial uh, demons who are trying to find some minor excuse to turn around and hang on to him and keep him in prison or re-prosecute him on some technicalities. Uh, they're, what they're trying to do, they're trying to save face. They're trying to save face for having been rejected in a court of law by his peers. And I just want to underscore the crime, the crime that this represents by our judicial system by the White House of George Bush and by this great injustice that Americans should abhor and stand up against. I will tell you, I am a candidate for president. If I do become president, all of these injustices and all of these prosecutors are going to have their names rake through the public. We're going to release all the secret activities that these people have been doing. And, I, and mark this well, they, it'll be like what we did with the Stasis when the Iron Curtain fell. People will be able to rake through all of this and see all the crimes that have been hidden through the American people. So really, take this to the bank. You're going to find out the great damage they did to this innocent person, Dr. Al Arian. And I want to tell you, this is an injustice of a magnitude difficult to comprehend. I want to add my voice, and I hope that decent people within the administration will stand up and reverse the decisions made by the White House. Today we will be focusing on the U.S. presidential election, and as well as congressional elections. What we're going to talk about more specifically is the relationship between agenda setting as part of the electoral process, and more specifically, the issue of civil liberties and U.S. presidential and congressional elections. I've invited two friends. To my right is Mr. Sean Mahar. He is a attorney, practicing attorney, civil rights attorney, and he is right now 
representing some important uh, uh, clients, and I hope he'll talk about uh, the issues and what they're in prison for. And we also have Professor Peter Allender, Professor of Law at William Mitchell College in Minnesota, who is also the former president of National Lawyers Guild, uh, uh, and also current president of Defense Lawyers Association, affiliated with the United Nations Commission on uh, uh, Rwanda. I welcome both of you. Hello, thank you. Thank uh, you. And let me ask you, how do you see the issue of election and the issue of agenda setting in which, you know, the things are put, uh, the important things uh, are put placed on the agenda, people reflect on that, people debate them, and then they vote on them. Is the agenda setting process including the issue of civil liberties at this time? Well, I'm, I'm not sure what, uh, what Sean's experience is, but I, I, of course I, I haven't heard much of this uh, civil liberties discussion. and. I think there's some political explanations for it. The, uh, uh, the question of uh, avoiding or the need to avoid the appearance of being soft on terrorism, I think, uh, has cowed the Democratic candidates from speaking about these issues and perhaps uh, the Republican candidates as well because the opposite side of protecting civil liberties is that government power has to be restrained. And if government power is restrained in the atmosphere that is, exists in Washington these days, the politicians who would suggest that become suspect. Um, uh, however, underlying this election are extremely important civil liberties issues, and um, one would hope that the American people in 2008 might do something like they did in 1800 with the Alien and Sedition Acts, where there was this huge uh, outflowing of uh, democratic support for Jefferson to get rid of those Alien and Sedition Acts. A vote against the Patriot Act by the American people would be a, a wonderful thing, but first we need a politician who says he's against it, or she. I think that no one seems to be speaking about civil liberties in this election it is astounding. What has been going on the last few years, let's take one example, wiretapping of U.S. citizens. We now know through Eric Lichtbaugh and other journalists who have investigated this that the Bush administration has had complete authority to wiretap American citizens both in their telephone calls and their emails, clearly in violation of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Where are the Democrats on this? Where are the Republicans on this? This has been going back and forth for months now when it's clear as day that the president has been violating the law. The closest analogy was the 70s when it was found out that the Nixon administration was doing this. And what happened? You know, you had the church committee hearings. You had basically a huge uproar among the American citizenry that the federal government had this power and abused it so profoundly. But here, this isn't even talked about in the general election cycle that I'm seeing. Well, I think that, that speaks to the success that uh, the Bush administration has had in creating the impression that there's an enemy or that there's a danger that's so great that uh, ordinary law uh, shouldn't apply, either internationally or domestically. And uh, that propaganda has been so successful that those of us who are concerned about civil liberties, who, uh, who defend people who are accused of, of terrorism or, or whatever that is, of course, terrorism is actually politically motivated violence. It's uh, difficult to see how that's going to be stamped out anytime soon. Um, but it's been used politically to cow the American people into think that, uh, thinking that the executive needs unlimited powers, and they've been very successful at it. But Professor Allender, we both know, we all know, that there are at least 400 cities and counties and few states in this country that have independent of each other passed resolutions asking for complete or partial repeal of the USA Patriot Act and have even vowed you know, not to spend any of your money to implement the questionable clauses of the, the, this law. The question I have for you is when there's such a grassroots movement, people independent of each other doing these things, why there's no national recognition, national name, and national face for this movement? Well, uh, I think it's related to the propaganda value of creating a, an enemy that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm happy to say that actually I was uh, involved in, in some of the early stages of this uh, Bill of Rights Defense Committee movement, mm -hmm. along with Dr. Samuel Arian, who uh, later was prosecuted and who I'm now defending. But uh, there was an immediate response at the grassroots level in opposition to the Patriot Act, and it, it has gone across the national country. leaders. Cheney, for example, just last week, uh, when confronted with the poll numbers showing that 70 percent of the people opposed the Iraq War, his answer was, so? Uh, which means there's a complete disdain for the uh, opinions of the American people. Um, 
but at this point, uh, the question of civil liberties has been so distorted and, uh, and the creation of this other. So we have to worry about the laws being abused against someone else, not with respect to ourselves, has caused people to think less clearly, I think, about what the real issues are when they're confronted with the war, when they're conf in Iraq, when they're confronted with the uh, Bear Stearns and the collapse of the economy, um, and the uh, idea that the greatest threat to our liberties actually is our own government is an idea that, uh, of course, is part of our founding uh, principles, but uh, not well articulated by either party today. Well, uh, when you say you know, Dick Cheney said so, and I, I think I share your disappointment and revulsion of that response, yet can we absolve the civil rights movement and the, uh, and the democratic forces so easily and say they are just sort of you know, outsmarted by the other side? And isn't there a failure on our part to build a national uh, movement and to give it a national name and a national face? Well, they're, they're, I can't answer that question fully, and uh, Sean, I'm sure, has, has additional things to add. But yes, it is true that, that's, uh, that there has been a, a lack of grassroots activism uh, fighting this. But um, as I've mentioned on other occasions, there's a, a quote from a national leader that I often use, and he said, well, of course, the ordinary people don't want war, but it's not up to them. Uh, first, you tell them that there's a threat. Uh, then you uh, uh, attack the pacifists for being disloyal, and you can do anything you want. And that was uh, Herman Goring in the 1946 war crimes trials. And he was merely echoing Machiavelli. And uh, the idea that a foreign enemy or the threat that is this inchoate threat can be used to manipulate a populace is an old, old trick. And the only way to fight that is for the populace itself to, uh, to be educated and to take action. Uh, but so far, the war on terrorism has been extremely successful in creating the impression that, uh, that the government needs to operate without limit. I also think, though, that it reflects a lack of faith that particularly the Democratic Party has in the American people. Because I think if you really bring these issues straight to the American people, they will respond. The average person does not want to be wiretapped. The average person does not want a war without end. The average person does not want a government that prosecutes people on secret evidence. The average person does not want a trial in which the lawyers don't see the evidence or people are locked up as enemy combatants. They want a fair system, something that they can be proud of, something that they know is fair for their neighbors, for themselves. And if they actually look at this stuff and the politicians present it, I think that they would actually back mm -hmm. them even stronger than they do now. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, it's, it's cowardice in many ways. Yes. And w would you say that in some cases people are not able to respond to these things because they don't know about it? They don't have a clear understanding of what's going on with different people. It's just not, you know, I, when I ask my students in the classroom, or different things, for instance, this, uh, is it 1955, resolution mm -hmm. 1955? People didn't have a clue about that. And then I ask is how is it that you can be going to a reasonably decent university and don't have the clue about important issues in your own life? That, I think, partly is the issue that we need to address. And given the fact that there are such success stories like MoveOn.org, who is not able to raise money and inform people, why is it that the civil rights movement has not been able to create a version of MoveOn.org for themselves? I can't, I can't really explain it. There's, in many ways, probably higher levels of political activism now in this country than there was 30 years ago. I mean, you have young people that are involved, that are blogging, that are doing online petitions, that are doing consciousness raising. There are older uh, people who have been doing this stuff for 30, 40, 50 years, and they all come together. There were you know, thousands, thousands, and thousands of people who protested the war, and still do. But there is that gap that we do see as far as what is going on on the ground in public opinion and what's presented in the media, and then getting over the hump as far as a politician who will actually be that vessel um, for that popular opinion. And it, it's a tough question. There are obviously many um, economic interests that like to keep the status quo the status quo. Well, uh, excuse me, but I, it, it seemed to me that I, I agree with what Sean said, but it, 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 and it, I want to expand on it a bit. There, there, it seems to me there are three things that are somehow interrelated. One is that there is just plain uh, uh, information and issue exhaustion. There have been so many attacks on civil liberties. They've been coming so quickly, they've been one after the other, that it's hard to even keep track of them. I, that's my job to study these, and it's hard for me to keep track. This bill that you mentioned, 1955, I wrote one of the few pieces uh, 
critical of the okay. bill, mm -hmm. saying that it was creating a new House and American Activities Committee, a new HUAC. There's been very little publicity about it. Um, uh, but there've been, there's been so many issues that it's one of, of many. Then we have a, a culture that has been, uh, where individual issues have been emphasized more. And when we talk about the YouTube generation and uh, individualization being the wave of the future, it's very difficult for people who don't have an analysis to develop it because everything is turned inward. And then we have the, uh, the problem, at least with respect to Iraq, that in the absence of a draft, uh, most people aren't touched directly by the war. And then Cheney, as he also said in that same interview, well, they're all volunteers, so we don't care what happens yeah. to them. And it's, it's someone else's problem in the way it, it seems to be conceptualized. And it's very difficult for people living their ordinary lives daily to conceive of these attacks being attacks on them, which of course they are, but uh, that's, uh, that's the uh, beauty of uh, divide and conquer and, and uh, creating diversions that uh, keep us from talking about the central Since issues. Since both of you are civil rights attorneys, what has been your experience vis-a-vis -vis the media and the academia. Like, I think you did an event yesterday also, a local campus. So what's your experience in terms of the role of the media and the academia in terms of maintaining some vigilance regarding civil liberties? Well, I think it's been a, a very difficult role with the media. I represent, my firm represents a number of people who've been charged with terrorism counts. In this country, if you're charged with anything, you're supposed to be presumed innocent. Obviously, unfortunately, that's not what happens. The first thing you see is a picture splattered across the paper or on the news, terrorism, terrorists, Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and then basically uh, objective, quote unquote, vitriol hurled at the person, despite the fact that it's presumed innocent, and uh, despite the fact that many times after a number of months, the charges will be shown to be flimsy. But you can't take back that initial splash that occurs. And that's something that we see in all of these cases, just the, the immediate jump to sensationalism and branding the person as a terrorist. And as a defense lawyer, you have to deal with the jury pool then that has gone through this, been infected with this over and over, case after case, and to try to undo that in the limited time you have in one criminal trial is a daunting, daunting task. Now, in terms of your own uh, involvement with Professor Sammy's case, Mm -hmm. Tell me how you've seen the media sort of, you know, responses and reactions and coverage, fairness or lack thereof, and where is he right now? What's the status of his uh, struggle? And we're talking about Dr. Samuel Sam Arian. Yes. Well, as, as you and, and perhaps some of your um, viewers know, Samuel Arian was accused of being the largest financier for terrorism in the Middle East uh, and arrested uh, in 2005 in February, or 2003 okay. rather, in February. And John Ashcroft had a press conference in, in Moscow uh, accusing him of uh, all of this, these financial uh, uh, dealings. Um, he was then held in solitary confinement for a year and a half in supermax-like uh, conditions. Um, and then there was a six-month trial in which the government produced 80 witnesses, um, uh, excerpts from 425,000 FISA-recorded communications or uh, uh, phone conversations, videotapes of violence in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera. And his defense lawyers presented a defense of saying um, everything he did was protected by the First Amendment. They offered no evidence, no uh, testimony. Uh, and these 12 jurors in Tampa, who had been exposed to this, this uh, propaganda, uh, came back and said that he was not guilty. He's, however, still in prison. And what has happened, uh, the, the, the artful work of the lawyers in that case and the fact that the trial went on so long meant that there was enough time for them to, uh, to offset that propaganda and for them to begin to think independently. And when that happens, a jury can be a wonderful thing because they can say, stop to the government. In this case, they did. But then the government, both the judge in the case and then the Justice Department, subverted the jury trial by manipulating the grand jury and the sentencing so that Dr. Arian, Dr. Alarian is still in jail today, two years, more than two years after being uh, acquitted, um, two years after the Justice Department promised to release him in uh, May of hunger strike that's uh, going on to the 20th day or more, um, uh, protesting the manipulation of the grand jury uh, in a way that's kept him in the United States. Now, I do have to say that, that when 
that the propaganda uh, pub in the media before his acquittal was huge. Then when he was acquitted, there was shock. And, the, the, and, silence. And, and then silence, and very little mainline media coverage of the manipulation of the system since his acquittal. A uh, few pieces have gotten through. I've written a couple pieces that have gotten some, uh, some uh, uh, but it's been very, very quiet. And this is a man who's been acquitted by an American jury. So there's a pattern to this thing when it was their hope, you know, some hope of him being in, con uh, indicted or convicted there was a lot of coverage, and when that right. happened, it disappeared. What has been your experience with Fahad uh, Hashmi's case? Well, Fahad Hashmi is a 28-year-old American citizen, grew up in Flushing, Queens, who is accused of providing material support to Al-Qaeda. And when Fahad uh, was arrested, he was arrested in England in 2006 for an event that allegedly occurred two years earlier. Um, the allegation is that someone that he knew stayed in his apartment for two weeks, and kept a suitcase with uh, raincoats, ponchos, and waterproof socks. And then that person who uh, allegedly kept that luggage in Fahad's London apartment took that luggage and gave it to supposedly the number three ranking member of Al-Qaeda in South Waziristan, Pakistan. So the charges, in effect, are that by allowing a person to keep a suitcase with waterproof socks in your apartment in England that went to supposedly Al-Qaeda, that's material support to terrorism. Fahad faces 70 years in prison for this, denies the charges, obviously. Um, but it's been, I think, a textbook example of how the media, first off, has branded Fahad a terrorist, despite the fact he's presumed guilty and despite the fact that there's going to be a very, very vigorous defense in this case. And he's been in prison for two years already? He's been in prison for over two years, uh, a year in Belmarsh Prison as a Category A prisoner in England, over a year here in the United States, and he's in solitary confinement. 24 hours a day, solitary confinement. Sometimes he gets an hour wreck in a cage. Um, complete ban from interaction with other inmates. Um, complete media ban on him for the most part. And the lawyers, myself and my partner, Karm Wahid, are under what are called special administrative measures along with our client, Fahad. So like Lynn Stewart, who some people are familiar with, if we relay information from our client to anyone else improperly, we face prosecution. An interesting... Uh, thing is also occurring. I just want to yeah. interrupt you for a second. I want people to recognize what you just said. So as an attorney, you have limited ability to do certain things. So you yourself are under regulatory authority as Linda was, uh, and uh, Lynn Stewart was, and she was punished for not following that. So please expand on that so people understand what's going on here. Yeah, in effect, these special administrative measures put a, a government eye on the attorneys. And if we relay any information from our client to the outside world, we face prosecution. And it, it, is, an, it is an amazing example of overreaching by the government to think that a defense lawyer can't express the views of their client. That's what an advocate is. We are the mouthpiece for our client. And that's even more important in a political case, because this is a political case um, for Fahad. He's being prosecuted because of politics and religion. And so for a client, to be stripped of the advocate whose job is to be their mouthpiece is a, a power grab so overwrought that it just truncates our idea of the adversarial system. It's un I, we believe, and we filed papers, that's unconstitutional and it's unethical. Um, but at this point, there have been a few judges that have upheld this, and they seem to think that this is the way that our system should be going. And this is just based on the accusation against your client, not exactly. the proof of anything, and by making the accusation, then your right to represent your client, or his right to be represented, is narrowed right. just by the nature of the charge. Exactly. And we must point out for the audience that Lynn Stewart <coughs> was one of the attorneys, along with Ramsey Clark and others, for Sheikh Umar Abdul Rahman, who was accused of masterminding the terrorist attack on the Twin Tower, the first terror attack. And she herself was indicted for three years, I think, uh, finally, and she got some... Uh, break on that, but that was the whole charge. She held a press conference in which she had apparently conveyed some of the ideas and that became the source. So it's not only the client, it's attorney rights have also been abridged under the present system. Now I need to ask a question of both of you, both of your lawyers. Why are American lawyers not doing something about that? Well, perhaps they don't have the courage that Pakistani lawyers have. Um, uh, the, uh, I, I don't want to do one-upsmanship here, but I have a client uh, also, Mohammed Warsame, who's not known well outside of New York, 
um, but he uh, uh, is being charged with material support because uh, he taught English to nurses and because he f was physically present somewhere. So his body being present was the material support and teaching English to nurses was the other material support. And, uh, it, and he's been held in solitary confinement for almost four years. Uh, we recently were able to get him out of solitary confinement, but uh, he's, as near as we can tell, is the longest pretrial detainee in American history. He's been held for five years. Uh, it'll be at least six before there's a trial. The Speedy Trial Act and the, and the Speedy Trial provisions of the Constitution say that if you demand a speedy trial, you're supposed to get one in 70 days. That was more than 1,000 days ago. And um, the judiciary is playing along with this distortion of the legal system based on these accusations that are purely political, as Sean said. Um, but uh, it's, uh, and it's, uh, I guess it's the thing that's important to recognize is what's happening is the U.S. has created legal exceptionalism by setting up Guantanamo. But now what's also happening is domestically, many Guantanamos are being set up in these cases by manipulating the law in particular cases so people get locked up for indefinite periods of time. The system doesn't work. The system laws don't apply. The Constitution means something different. Uh, all in the interest of this claim of executive power and this need to protect us from the fears that uh, they've been uh, propagating. And, uh, and the media doesn't care and the academia doesn't watch the media not caring. And we have a situation of despair and chaos, but hopefully that will be the agenda for the civil rights movement in the context of election. We'll continue the discussion after a short break. back. We are continuing our discussion about civil rights in the context of elections. We have just been joined by another friend, and that's Ms. Judith Karpova, who is a longtime activist on the issues of war, opposing the war, and supporting civil liberties and human rights. Welcome. Thank you. And we are also going to show you some of our paintings that she has made about uh, war in Iraq. Well, they're actually made by a woman that I met in Iraq, uh, okay. an Iraqi woman painter, Amal. Uh, okay. okay. We'll be showing that a little later. Let me ask you, how do you see this issue? And I think you have the twin focus of war and the loss of liberties and human rights. How do you see that playing out right now? Well, I'm personally affected by it. Um, I went to Iraq as a human shield before the war as a protest against the war. I've been watching this happen, first militarily and then economically, and they seem to have developed this tag team between these two policies, uh, you know, ever since the days of the Vietnam War, at which time I was, I was a very radical activist. And, uh, you know, when that kind of, when the war was over and we all went back to our personal lives, lo and behold, we've got free trade policies and now the Treasury Department and, and uh, a tiny elite uh, in the Europe and the U.S. has taken over the economies of three continents. And then you have those policies being applied to uh, the Balkans, to Yugoslavia. And when the opportunity arose with the destruction of the World Trade Center, there was an excuse to apply those policies to Iraq. And they converged there. The economic stripping of Iraq of all of its autonomy and it, it, the invasion and occupation. So the economic invasion was enforced by a military invasion and, you know, I'm, I'm an older person, actually. I'm in my 60s now, and, and I thought to myself, when does this ever stop? And who's going to do it if I don't? And where have I been while this has been creeping up and getting a grip on, on, our, on our global economy and political system? So I was really in despair, and all I could think of to do was just to go there and meet these people face to face. And because Western lives count in this country and in this political system. And uh, people of color, people who have strange names, people who can be manipulated to be seen as enemies don't count. So I had a little leverage by actually going there. And I went. I left shortly before the war. I met many Iraqi people. I don't know if any of them are still alive. I, well, I know that two of them are still alive. That's all I know. 
And I came back, and there was a letter waiting for me from the Treasury Department saying that I had broken the economic sanctions against Iraq uh, by going there and uh, buying food to eat and allegedly performing a service. Uh, I was a human shield, and what we were trying to do was defend the civilian infrastructure so that it wouldn't be bombed again, which in that destruction, especially the destruction of water treatment plants, and the children having no, no clean water to drink and the Iraqis being unable to import repair parts directly led to the death of almost a million children. Okay. So I come back and I'm being told you bought a cup of tea and therefore we're going to fine you thousands of dollars. So I've been fighting this in the courts uh, since if 2003. We court, if we go to court, let me just bring it in. Sure. <clears throat> Ms. Karpova makes a very important uh, <clears throat> point there, that's the human price of wars and conflicts in terms of million kids killed, and I think it was Madeleine Albright who was asked by Ted Koppel, was it worth it, and she said yes, it was. That <laughs> meaning the price of 500,000 to a million kids killed. Because they were all her kids, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I think the question then becomes is, t talk to us about the human price of this thing, and for clients are concerned, you know, people that you see, you meet, their families, and what, how is it impacting the communities and individual families of the accused? I don't, I don't think a person who hasn't been in this situation can really understand the devastation that these charges bring. Because it's not just the person who is charged and locked up in solitary confinement. There's a whole web of lives that are connected to people. It's the immediate family. It's the extended family. It's the community. It's the city. And it's also global in this day and age. So what happens is you have the immediate impact of a person whose life is being destroyed. You have the economic impact that bail is either astronomically high or not given at all. Attorney's fees are very expensive um, if they are, go the route of paying for their attorneys to, to fight the case. And to mount the defense, there are other costs involved. So what happens is you see these cases all around the country using up resources, using up emotional capital, and it is a tactic that we've seen throughout this country's history of keeping movements and keeping targeted populations from having a forward-moving agenda. It keeps communities on their heels because you're defensive and not actually moving the agenda forward. So it, it's, it's devastating on all these counts. Yeah. And have you, you uh, I understand correctly, you had personal experience of being sort of targeted. So not only other lives that you saw being touched by war, but your own life has been touched. Is it yes, it has. I mean, the, the uh, Treasury Department, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, has the power to bring charges and decide on guilt. And under the law, the Iraq Sanctions Law of the United States, they are not required to uh, present any evidence. There is no hearing. There is no presence, um, adjudicative presence of any impartial body to uh, assess their charges and um, require that they, that they substantiate them, they can just say, well, this is what we think you did, and, uh, and you're guilty, and pay up, and if you don't, well, we can take your house, we can uh, ruin your job. Uh, I'm on Social Security. It, they could take that. So, um, and, and yes, I mean, I, I think that, I think that uh, my case is much less threatening to me personally than the case of your client. Um, but this is how they start. They start with people that, that um, are, are Arab American, that uh, even though they're citizens, they use vulnerable target populations. And, and they, they bring the most serious, it's almost as if they're testing, they're doing some kind of social engineering tests to see how much can we, how far can we go before people will resist. In my case, they're charging me money. You know, they're not locking me up thus far um, because I am not in as vulnerable a position. But once, I, I think, in my opinion, once that precedent is started, um, they can use these really state terror tactics on a wider and wider array of U.S. citizens. It just depends on what our tolerance level is. And I, re I really think what the country is moving towards is the idea that certain 
types of thoughts are criminal. <laughs> and we see that with the, with the House bill you've been talking about, um, the idea that there are homegrown domestic gotcha. radicals. And it's the idea that if you see someone get prosecuted, you're not going to have any thoughts about challenging U.S. policy. That if the government has the authority to declare someone a radical, that they can put them in jail or have them be subpoenaed to some type of government body. If you look in England right now, in London, they have cameras all over their streets, everywhere. They have control orders where someone can be told. You get a knock on the door by the police and told, you're under a control order. You don't have any legal process. You don't have an attorney who can challenge it. You're just told you're under a control order. So you have to report to the police. You can't leave a certain jurisdiction. All these types of constrictions placed on your freedom of movement with no process at all. Why? Because the government decided that you were a radical. That's where this is all going towards, the, the criminalization of ideas. And once a society moves to that point where people are afraid to even have an idea, what is that? Is that something that we really want to live in? But that, I think, again, mystifies me. Why is it that the campuses where ideas are supposed to be, that's the marketplace of ideas, professors, intellectual writers, the media, the thinkers, has such small concern about it that they're expressing publicly, and therefore it seems like it's a clean sweep for the other side. You know, that they are having a field there that nobody's there to, visual, to stop them or to talk so. To them. In your own experience, what you saw, uh, and you described the notion of worthy and unworthy victims. You know, some people when they die, they are worthy victims, and people talk about them. Other people are unworthy; nobody talks about them. Million people killed. How, how, what was the quality of life you saw in Iraq of people? I saw an orderly society. I saw a completely integrated society, and I, I met I met a, a, a culture of, of hospitable and kind of dryly humorous people. Uh, you, I could not walk into a shop without being offered tea and cookies. Um, I visited a mosque, and uh, you know, with a few other human shields, and we were all invited home for dinner by the caretaker. Um, Everywhere I went, I, I, was, I was welcomed as a person from the United States, and people were touched that I cared, that somebody from the United States cared about their lives enough to want to actually go and meet them. So I saw, I, and I saw a, a society where they were reviving from the sanctions uh, because they had become such an international scandal uh, that other countries were breaching them were breaching those sanctions and were beginning to trade with Iraq. And so the society was recovering. And uh, this administration and the previous one would not permit that. They would not permit Iraq to e recover because, in my view, uh, no, uh, no country is allowed to be a, a self-reliant, independent economic entity. Some excuse or other is, is used to knock them down so that they're kind of brought into into the neoliberal free market, really. Neoliberal dependencies. Yeah, I mean, to me there's no question, Iraq's got about $3 trillion worth of oil. So if the public has to pay for the war in borrowed money, it doesn't matter uh, because the payoff is still going to, to these large corporations. And that's the kind of culture that, that we're seeing evolve. Um, I guess to respond to what you're saying, my thought is, and I guess I think along with Gandhi on this one, mm -hmm. no society can be controlled that doesn't cooperate. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It cannot be. It cannot be. And, and when people stop cooperating, uh, all of this breaks down. As terrifying as it is, it can't be enforced. I mean, government, the people doing the enforcing are paid next to nothing. <laughs> they haven't got that much vested in carrying it out. It's these big show, you know, example, um, trials and, and accusations that are meant to make the rest of us self-police. But if we don't self-police, if we challenge uh, all of these orders, they can't be enforced. So that's why I feel that, that this has been more of a blessing than anything else for me to, to have the opportunity to, you know, to, get to, to get to actually say that. I've experienced it. I was very frightened when it first happened. I'm not nearly as frightened now. Ms. Karpova. Since you have looked at this thing with such sensitivity and sense of commitment, where do you see a silver lining? Are there any signs of hope that you see on any horizon? Uh, 
I, I, I can't see anything that I can definitely put my finger on. I, I just get a sense that we're being tested as a nation and we're being tried as to what our values are and that we're in a period of really reflecting on what do we stand for, what do we believe in, how much are we willing to tolerate. And of course, the, uh, the fact that the most horrible aggressions are taking place against people that are, have been marginalized, have been really subjected to a kind of racist marginalization um, has given us like a little time to say, well, this doesn't really apply to me. But I think the, Im the whole issue of impunity, especially impunity with the economy, that you can do anything to anyone, you get bailed out, you get let off the hook, you don't have to prove anything, is making people feel more that it, it's one whole um, project of, of just complete um, exploitation. I see, it, I see something hopeful in, in the candidacy of Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. um, I see something hopeful in the persistence of, of many uh, attorneys and ma many civil liberties groups who come forward to defend people, even in my own area. I mean, people are out on vigil every day and every weekend. Um, so the persistence in, of, with which people are, re are are digging their heels in is hopeful to me. And I suppose, in the end, I guess we all take ourselves as a, a barometer. I, I, I no longer feel kind of fear or despair, but I'm just, I'm just going to do what I can do. And the consequences may not be within my control, but my actions are. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. How do you see the same thing? Any signs of hope on any horizon? I think there are some signs of hope. I mean, the world is in a state of flux and transition right now. Yeah. And it's not just within the United States. We have, we have a, a world basically on fire from North Africa all the way to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And there is no way looking at history that monumental changes aren't going to come about from these events. And with global communications now, people can see that there are alternate ways of living and that you don't have to have despotism. You don't have to have sham democracy either. So there is resistance all around the globe to, to uh, modes of production that rely just on crass commercialism. Mm -hmm. And it is hopeful, but it's not something that's going to come easy. And we have a lot of clocks that we're racing against. We saw uh, this week another um, section of the Antarctic <laughs> iceberg, seven times the size of Manhattan, dropped into the ocean. We have other. Uh, climate controls that are kicking in um, against us, not to mention the wars and what happens when something spins out of control. But I am hopeful that people can come together and see our common humanity, and that's what we need to do. Now, in terms of that common humanity, have you seen any signs with any presidential or congressional candidates that are providing some kind of a clear focus on restoring civil liberties? I wish I see, I wish I could say I've seen a lot. I think from Barack Obama's past history as a legislator, um, there are hopeful signs that he would be um, a person that would stand up for civil liberties. But again, this isn't a, a topic that's getting a lot of attention right. in the debates or in any other forums at this point. How about congressional level or city level? Do you see anything? Much discussion on that at the city council level in New York? Not a tremendous amount that I'm seeing. We have communities around the country that have been involved in passing resolutions against the Patriot Act, passing resolutions against the war. Um, we have some areas that are even um, passing resolutions or fighting against military recruitment in their cities. Mm -hmm. So there, there are hopeful signs. But the higher up the food chain of politics <laughs> you go, the more and more silence you see on these issues. Uh, now, are there many civic organizations that approach you, being the fact that you are a civil rights attorney <coughs> doing certain important work? for background information, for explanation. What kind of resource have you become for community around you? Uh, we get calls all the day, uh, all day long, um, from people, many individuals, um, who are approached by, say, the FBI um, for some reason that has nothing to do, it seems, with the criminal case. 
Um, we get calls from other organizations um, for, for guidance on handling various civil rights issues and criminal issues. But I have to say, it's in many ways an overload. Um, there are so many lawyers doing this. There are so many organizations with finite resources. And there's also a huge information vacuum. A lot of people, I think, don't avail themselves to the organizations and resources that are out there because they simply don't know they exist. All right. And Ms. Karpova, what kind of resource have you become to communities around you? What kind of people approach you and ask you for guidance or help or information? I've, I've been very, very uh, beautifully supported by my community. Um, every time that my case has moved through the court system, there's been a lot of coverage, a lot of radio interviews, a lot of local television interviews. Um, I've written a book on my time in Iraq, mm -hmm. and um, you know I've been helped. What's the title of the book? Sp the working title is Speaker of Stones. Okay. And I've been helped by my community to find agents and to uh, give readings from it. Um, we have a lot going on in my area, and, and it might, might be a cross-section of the country. We have, we've had people who've sat in on my congressperson's, in his office, to demand that he impeach <laughs> the president and vice president. We have people standing in the mall um, every weekend in front of the Army recruiters, and they've been brought to court by the mall for curtailing their business, and they're being threatened with $50,000 fines, and they're just digging in and getting civil rights attorneys and pressing forward, which, is, which, which I think is, is really just, just keep challenging all of these restrictions and, and keep using ourselves as examples and, and pressing forward. Because I think as, as individuals kind of break out of this fear, um, other people do too. And, and I think there's, there's really beginning to be, a, I mean, you can just scare people for so long. I mean, even in Iraq, there were certain things that Saddam Hussein just could not do. He had to give people free public education. He had to give them free public health care. Uh, he had to give them arms. Every single person was armed. So dictatorships walk a very fine line, and there comes a point of revulsion where people stop being afraid and just really start pushing back, and that's when the whole thing cracks. Very well stated. What we have heard from our two friends, and pr prior to that with Peter Allender also, that vigilance is the price of, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. We must always remain vigilant. We must also understand the expanding horizons of global consciousness in terms of equal dignity and equal worth for every human life. Yes. We have people who have given up their own home, their jobs, to go and see other people who are under under threat of war or in the condition of war who are afflicted and to allay their fears and their suffering. And that's what our human, common humanity, shared humanity is all about. And we will end this program by showing you the uh, paintings that uh, Ms. Karpova has brought from uh, Iraq and made by a lady named Amal. I thank both my guests and we'll continue the discussion on the you. forum later on. Thank you very much. <laughs>